Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers soils and sediments. By the end of this episode, you will be able to clarify the differences between soils and sediments, and you can describe how they develop through time. Furthermore, you will be prepared to discuss how archaeological sites and layers relate within the contexts of their soils and sediments. You can find numerous definitions and perspectives, but this presentation concentrates on the issues that are most relevant for archaeology. At least for archaeologists and most geologists, a sediment is a general term to describe all forms of naturally occurring geological particles, such as sand, silt, or clay, that can occur in variable combinations within sedimentary units or layers. In this view, some sediments could be transformed into soils through time. In most definitions, a soil always is in process of formation or development, involving several factors that act on the pre-existing geological sediments. You can think of sediments as the particles that have broken down from a geological parent material. Rock formations, limestones, and other primary materials erode mechanically and chemically into smaller pieces of clasts that we can identify today in sedimentary units or layers. You can think of soils as the results of various transformations of sediments through time. Typically, a sedimentary unit will be transformed into a set of internal horizons of a soil. Each horizon from top to bottom shows different color, texture, organic content, and other factors of how the sediment has been transformed. For any archaeological excavation, the individual artifacts and other findings need to be recorded in their stratigraphic contexts. The associated sedimentary layers and soil formation horizons can be complicated in places where multiple layers represent the outcomes of several centuries or millennia. Beginning with the geological particles, they can be described in their size or in their combinations of sizes. Individual pieces could be measured as clay, silt, or sand. Larger pieces or clasts are understood as rock particles of gravel, pebbles, cobbles, or boulders. Often, a sedimentary layer will incorporate different percentages of clay, silt, and sand, as well as larger rock inclusions. Different compositions can be discerned in categories such as silty clay, sandy clay, and others. These categories can be estimated with a simple field test, using a small pinch sample of a sediment and then adding a little bit of water to form a ball. Next, you try to shape the ball into a ribbon, and you can observe the length and the texture of the ribbon. With more sand content or larger sized particles, the ribbon is weaker and it feels grittier. With more clay content or smaller sized particles, the ribbon is stronger and it feels smoother. If the material does not form into a ball, then the particles are the size of sand or perhaps larger. Water does not remain trapped in the spaces between large sized clasts, and accordingly most sands and gravels are well drained. With particles that are smaller than the sand, water can be trapped and create enough cohesion to form a ball shape. Next, if the ball cannot be shaped into a ribbon, then the material can be categorized as loamy sand. It consists mostly of sand with a lesser amount of the smaller particles of silt or clay. If the ball does form into a ribbon, then the material could consist of a wide range of mostly smaller sized particles. A shorter or weaker ribbon indicates larger grains, while a longer or stronger ribbon indicates smaller grains. 
You can add a little more water to a ribbon for creating a semi-liquid consistency, and then you can feel the texture between your fingers. At this point in the test, you can remember that larger particles will feel grittier, while smaller particles will feel smoother. With the different ribbon lengths, you can identify the specific texture category. The weakest ribbon with the grittiest texture would be a sandy loam. The next categories of loamy textures can be identified in gradations of their relative amounts of sand, silt, or clay. The strongest ribbon with the smoothest texture would be a pure clay. If you prefer to measure more precisely about the percentage of each particle size category, then you can sift a sediment sample through a set of geological sieves. Each sieve contains a wire mesh of different measured size. First, you arrange the sieves from largest through smallest to catch each size category separately. Next, you measure the percentage in each category. This approach is reliable, but you should be aware that different standards of measurement systems have been developed for various purposes. In any case, you should be able to match the observed particle sizes with standards of clay, silt, and sand, possibly divided into subcategories. Another fundamental part of describing a sediment involves notation of color. The most reliable approach involves a standard reference color chart. You should be aware that sediment color can change when wet versus dry, especially when working with smaller size particles and organic components. You should be prepared to record both wet and dry conditions. The Munsell color system has been the most popular standard for archaeologists. It accounts for three aspects of color in terms of hue, value, and chroma. The hue can be described in principal categories of red, yellow, blue, and others, each with subdivisions into a total of 100 hues. Within each hue, the value refers to the gradation from dark to light. The chroma refers to the degree of variance from a pure color in terms of the amount of saturation of the hue. Using a standard color chart like in the Munsell system, you can coordinate the hue with its value and chroma. You could record many other aspects of a sediment, such as its structure, consistence, angularity of particles, and nature of the upper and lower boundary of a layer. I will not present all of the details right now, but you can appreciate how the characteristics of a sediment can vary from one layer to another, and even within a single sedimentary unit. Now that you have seen how individual sediments can be described, you can consider how a sedimentary layer could be transformed into a soil with internal soil horizons. A soil profile reveals an active zone of organic life at the surface, with gradations of different effects extending downward into a set of horizons. Usually, the surface is equated with an organic horizon, sometimes called the O horizon. Just beneath the organic surface, a soil contains an upper unit of an A horizon. Many people refer to this upper portion as the topsoil, where you can see the effects of organic material decomposing into the sediment. The A horizon tends to contain the most plant roots and animal disturbance. Through time, the A horizon will become depleted of its nutrients and minerals that end up concentrated in the next lower unit of the B horizon. The B horizon sometimes is called a subsoil. The mineral composition has been transformed due to the interaction with the overlying A horizon. Usually, plant roots and animal disturbances are less extensive at this depth. The next underlying unit can be described as the C horizon. This depth 
typically is beneath the reach of the effects that created the A and B horizons. Beneath the sedimentary unit, eventually you will encounter a bedrock of a geological formation. The upper portion of the bedrock in most cases has been altered through weathering and contact with the overlying sediment. You potentially could discern sub-elements of this contact zone. Overall, a soil profile can be described as a sedimentary layer that has undergone a number of processes, resulting in a set of internal horizons. Organic material naturally grows at the surface, but it creates effects extending deeper into the soil profile. In addition to their internal horizons, soils could be described or classified according to many different attributes or properties. Most often, soil classifications are concerned with the potential for engineering or agriculture, looking at factors such as moisture retention or organic content that could be relevant for some archaeological studies as well. Most important for archaeology is to understand the process of how and when a soil profile came to exist. If you can understand this process, then you can situate a specific archaeological layer within the context of what happened before, during, and after the deposition of artifacts into the sediment of an ancient living surface. The original surface of course has changed with the accumulation of more sediment, concurrent with ongoing soil development. The process of soil formation is known as pedogenesis. In the scientific literature, the first formal treatment of pedogenesis has been attributed to Vasily Dokochev more than 100 years ago with further refinements by Hans Jenny in 1941. Vasily Dokochev's original breakthrough was to conceptualize of pedogenesis as the outcome of complex interrelated factors of climate, geological parent material, and biological processes occurring over a length of time. Hans Jenny modified and expanded the pedogenesis formula. He added relief or slope of the terrain as a primary factor, and he distinguished the biological processes into separate categories of floral and faunal components. In this view, any particular soil is the result of the inputs of climate, organic agents, relief, and parent material over a period of time. A formula of pedogenesis could be expressed in different ways and with a number of problematic issues, but most importantly, we can be aware of the range of variables involved in soil formation. Climate sometimes is viewed as directly relational to soil development. Conditions of warmer temperature and more rainfall will increase weathering, biological growth, and erosion. The reality, of course, is more complicated than a unidirectional formulaic relationship. Long-term stability of climate will allow more time for a soil to continue developing. The pace of soil development can vary in places with pronounced seasonal differences in temperature and rainfall. If the climate undergoes a major shift, then the entire soil forming process can be interrupted and later need to restart. As you have seen already in this presentation, the parent material of a sediment is transformed through time into a soil. Accordingly, the physical properties of the parent material can create varied outcomes of how a soil can develop. If the parent material consists of clays and silts with high water retention and cohesion, then organic growth can be stable and strong with a result of thick soil horizons. If the parent material happens to be composed primarily of well-drained and loose beach sands, then only a thin and weak zone of organic growth is possible at the surface. In these conditions, soil development can be very slow, and it can be interrupted easily. Another major factor in soil development is the relief or slope of the terrain. Often, a slope is categorized by its angle or degree. 
Steep slopes tend to have little soil development due to erosion of material, while gentler slopes can support stronger soil development. Additionally, you should be aware of differences in the position from the top to bottom of a slope along a landform. Ridge tops potentially could provide stable settings for soil development, but their perimeter edges tend to be easily eroded down the adjacent slopes. Materials always will accumulate in thicker layers near the base of a slope, where they come to rest at the interface with an adjacent, flatter landform surface. If you can be aware of the larger picture of relief and slope across a landscape, then you can identify the variation in patches of soil properties. Furthermore, these patches could support different cultural patterns of land use, with implications about where to search for archaeological deposits. The next major factor in soil formation involves biological processes. Some studies refer to the degree of biological disturbance or turbation, such as when plant roots intrude downward, or when people or animals disturb the ground. Other studies emphasize the role of plants and animals, including people, for introducing organics into the ground and thereby enhancing the soil forming process. Plant growth in particular is important when root systems effectively stabilize the upper zone of a sediment. However you may define pedogenesis, the role of time is critical. Time affects all of the other variables such as the climate, the parent material, the relief, or the biological processes. Generally, soil formation can be stronger when given a longer period of time to act. If any condition in the environment happens to change, then the soil forming process may be interrupted or need to restart. When considering how to classify soils with their diverse variables, several approaches have used different criteria. Among those approaches, the system of the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been influential and effective, using a taxonomy that accommodates most standards. This taxonomy describes 12 soil orders, with further subdivisions eventually resulting in more than 14,000 soil series. At the level of the soil order, Time is the primary variable controlling 8 of those 12 orders. The remaining 4 of the 12 orders are defined by other traits. Time is not directly measured in these soil orders, but rather the effects of time are noticed in the formation of internal soil horizons. The thickness and strength of the horizons relative to one another can reflect the amount of time involved in their formation. More details can be ascertained when knowing the length of time needed for the observed effects on specific compositions, minerals, and nutrients. Regarding the other 4 of 12 soil orders, they refer to unusual characteristics regardless of the effects of time. They may have belonged to any of the other 8 soil orders at one point, but unusual circumstances have changed their conditions. In deep excavations, archaeologists sometimes encounter multiple layers of different sediments and soil compositions that cannot be categorized easily in standard soil taxonomies. In these cases, archaeologists need to understand the changing context of the sediments and the soils as they developed through time. At any single point in time, people naturally lived on the available ground surface and with the soil formation conditions of that time period. When we see multiple archaeological layers, one superimposed over the other, then we can infer a chronological sequence of land surfaces that accumulated over time each with its own context of its sediments and soil formation process. Generally, soil formation will be interrupted whenever the conditions of the environment happen to change, 
the cultural use of a ground surface potentially could result in such a change, and the outcome can be enhanced when it coincides with other factors such as change in climate or local vegetation, or the patterns of slope erosion and deposition. Whenever people occupy a ground surface, the underlying sedimentary unit contains some degree of soil formation, such as in the idealized profile of soil horizons overlying the geological bedrock. Artifacts are deposited on the surface, and they can become mixed into the upper zone of the sediment. Later, if a new sedimentary unit starts to accumulate over the site, then the soil formation process will begin again, and with new conditions. The older soil profile becomes buried, and its O-horizon no longer exists. Now, different artifacts may be deposited simultaneously with the accumulation or buildup of the new sedimentary layer. And eventually, a new soil profile will develop with its own internal horizons. The surface may continue to build upward with a growing O horizon and A horizon. The characteristics of the subsoil or B horizon could be weak, and the characteristics of a deeper C horizon may not ever develop in some cases. The process then can repeat any number of times whenever conditions of the environment change sufficiently to trigger the end of one soil forming condition and the beginning of another. Such a change could occur due to a shift in climate, different slope erosion and deposition patterns, or the actions of people for increasing or decreasing their intensity of using a ground surface. A buried soil profile can be called a paleosol, or old soil. Its internal characteristics tend to be less clear than can be seen in a modern, active soil profile. Here you can see an example where a few different soil horizons developed over one another. Periodic storm surge episodes brought layers of beach sand and coral debris over this area, effectively interrupting the soil forming process each time. The periods of soil development in this location were enhanced by slope-eroded silts. In another example close to a seashore, the sediment was composed almost entirely of beach sand, with little or no opportunity for formal soil development. In just one thin layering, you can see the position of a short-lived beach surface. Organic material barely had started to accumulate here, but then rapidly it was buried beneath more sand, perhaps during a sudden episode such as a typhoon surge. Other sites reveal more complicated excavation profiles, such as shown here in a sequence extending more than 3,500 years old. In this case, change in sea level and coastal morphology created substantially different conditions through time in terms of the sedimentary composition, rate of deposition, amount of organic material, and other factors. A number of different sedimentary units each underwent a new soil forming process, with variable results over the course of several centuries. Overall, you can think of sediments as existing first as geological units, and then they could be transformed through soil formation processes, or pedogenesis. In any given location, the sedimentary layers and soil profiles developed through time. Archaeological deposits can be understood within those variable contexts. In concluding this episode, now you should be aware of the different processes of how sediments and soils develop. You should be prepared to study these changing contexts as fundamental parts of any archaeological site. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.